Your voice, your opinion, your community. Fact TV, free speech, protected. Good morning. Today is July 20th, 2022. Sometimes I forget what year it is. Forget the days, obviously. I'm Charlie Jarris, and I'm doing my first show in a number of years. Uh, maybe some of you remember me uh, from Travels with Charlie. I did it for 15 years, and I really enjoyed it, but started getting a little old, so I sort of quit. But uh, I, hopefully I'm back again. Today, my first show, and the show is called, as you saw, The Charlie Show. And that may change in time also. But my first show today is with Liam Madden. He is running for U.S. Uh, US representative mm -hmm. in the House. Uh, this is, I believe, the first time you're running at, for anything, yes. right? This is, this is the first time, which I think a lot of people are sort of uh, interested in that, that you're, you're running for the first time for anything. You've never been a selectman. You've never been on the library board or anything of that sort. This is the first time you're running for something. Which is, which is quite interesting to me. Now, Liam is my neighbor, uh, and I've known Liam uh, for a number of years. And I'm going to start out with talking to Liam about his history. Uh, and can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Uh, I grew up in Vermont. I started life in Long Island, New York when I was three or four. My family moved up to Stowe, Vermont, and by the time I was 11, we moved down to Bellows Falls, which are very different towns, as you know. Yeah. Uh, so that right there was just a, a pretty uh, strong life lesson about um, class and, and wealth and just how different cultures can be because of that. Um, then... I, I went to high school here in Bellas Falls, and when I graduated, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. So I, I knew I needed to grow up before I went to college or really took whatever that next path was going to be in life. And so I joined the military. And that was in August of 2002. And when I went to basic training in January of 2003, uh, not shortly thereafter, a couple weeks later, the United States invaded Iraq. And I was immediately pretty skeptical if that was a necessary thing to do. Um, it, felt, it felt like there was a lot of propaganda in the air making up this uh, exaggerating a threat to mm -hmm. the United States. Yeah. But, you know, growing up, I was pretty darn interested in military history. And one of the things that I thought I knew was that Vietnam was kind of a travesty in most people's eyes, and we would learned the lesson of being a, the bully of the world um, and using our military to just force our will down people's throats across, across the world, right or wrong. And the other thing that I thought I knew was that, um, well, and it, the last time we <laughs> went to war in Iraq, we, we were only there for a couple of weeks in the Persian Gulf War in 1991. Uh, so. Although I was pretty skeptical at first, I didn't, I didn't take any drastic action because I thought this, this could play out a number of ways, and one of which could be it's over really soon. So um, one thing leads to another, and sure enough, I find myself in Iraq in 2004, 2005, and by this time it was pretty clear that there were no weapons of mass destruction, that there was a lot of uh, kind of ma manipulation of the news, manipulation of, of public information to justify the war in the first place, and so we all knew that at that point. Um, and my experience in Iraq was that um, the United States was, um, the Iraqi people really hated us being there. Um, and I could sympathize with that. I could imagine me being the 19 year old kid I was at the time, seeing foreign soldiers on my street and being pretty resentful as well. Um, by the time I got back, um, I wanted to do something about it. I felt a, a bit like the good German in the, <laughs> Uh, the 1930s who just watched something really awful happening and didn't say anything. Right. So I got involved um, with some organizing. And I eventually became the leader of an organization called Iraq Veterans Against the War. We were um, exactly what that name would, would say. We were a bunch of military veterans that had experienced the Iraq War and felt like we, we need to call attention to the fact that this this is not right and that felt at for a time as the 
the reason for me being alive. Like I just felt so much motivation and like a cause. And um, eventually you get burnt out on being an activist and being that kind of activist where you're just against something. Right. And so it, I, I have a, a quote on my, my email. Every email I've sent in probably the last 15 years is to change a reality, don't fight the existing status quo, but build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. And that's by a guy named Buckminster Fuller. And so that's, that quote kind of inspires, well, what do you want to create? What's that new model you want to do? And uh, pretty much from then on, my, my work, my life, my study was about how do you have a more perfect marriage between humans and nature? Uh, what does a sustainable human civilization look like? And um, I got involved in solar energy. I've started several businesses from a cafe to a food manufacturer to an environmental fundraising organization. That environmental fundraising organization was recognized by MIT for um, a sustainability award, award called the Solve Award. Um, my anti-war work was recognized for, with a human rights award for the, from the Institute for Policy Studies. And um, I moved back to Vermont around six years ago from Boston, where I went to college at Northeastern University. And um, I just, you know, I, I fell in love with Vermont growing up here. Even the possibility of raising children at that time six years ago meant I would want to do that in Vermont. And you know that I moved, I moved right next door to you. <laughs> um, and we, I got back involved with solar energy when I was here. And that's what I'm doing right now for my day job. Um, and I decided that, you know, I have, I have two children now, two kiddos below three years old, that I love them and the promise of their future too much to allow the status quo of politics to continue without at least offering myself into service, um, trying to address or at least bring into the conversation some important uh, facts and perspectives that are just not talked about by either party. So you got married. I mean, I, you touched upon that. Okay. Your wife's name is Lauren. Yes. And you got married at the Rockingham Meeting House. Yes, I did. Is, which yes. is a wonderful place to get married. And you had your reception at the your barn. Rockingham Hill Farm. Yes. And was that a wonderful experience for you? Uh, it was one of the best days of my life, Charlie, for sure. Okay. Yes. Yeah. And I experienced it. And, I, and one of my best days, too. It was a really <laughs> wonderful day. Uh, in in Vermont, in, in the Greater Falls area, in mm -hmm. Rockingham. So you, uh, you, 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 a little bit of history, which is good, okay? And, uh, of course, your, 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 your family lives in the area also. Mm -hmm. Your mom and, and your dad lives not too far away either, too. I believe in Keene. And, yes. And so you, you have family here. You have supporting uh, roots. Yeah. yeah. And um, so why, I mean, maybe keep it relatively brief, why do you want to become a U.S. rep for the state of Vermont? I believe human civilization is kind of driving off a cliff. And the, the uh, solution is the definition of insanity by, by my calculations. You know, that, that old phrase, to try something over and over and again and expect different results. That's, that's the solution I hear from the existing two-party setup. We'll just continue to uh, change the players of this game, but never really think about changing the rules of the game so that we get better results. Because as far as I can see, the two-party system, it doesn't actually represent most people. Most people don't fit completely neatly in one party or the other. Right. They, it leaves out a lot of nuance. So it doesn't represent us. It drives us apart because both parties are deeply incentivized to just blame all their shortcomings, why they didn't get anything done on that evil other party, and they make caricatures, they make demons out of the other party. And then that accelerates into uh, a society that has no trust and no ability to dialogue with the other side. Uh, it's driving us apart. It's not solving our problems. I mean, if you just look at some of the big collective problems that I know you see in our world, there a lot of them get worse. and. Um, you look at something like what is foundational to what I'm, uh, why I'm running, energy. Um, neither neither party even talks about the real issues, and never mind getting anywhere towards an agreement about them. 
So it's not solving our problems, it's driving us apart, it's not representing us, and it's controlled by elites. I mean, you have uh, any party structure, people with the most resources in society will invest heavily in controlling those parties to keep things uh, to their liking. So I think that's a broken system. And if we continue to just try the same thing over and over again of just electing a person that you like uh, instead of a person that is looking at the root causes and has a vision for how to change that system so it produces better results, uh, we're going to be going around in circles, never getting anything done, exhausting ourselves. Meanwhile, uh, countries that use advanced technology very well, but maybe are dictatorial or authoritarian, are probably going to uh, outcompete us in many ways. If we're wasting all of our energy as heat disagreeing with each other instead of putting it towards building something thriving and beautiful. Now, the pandemic obviously uh, has caused a lot of stress uh, in in the, in the world, without a doubt. Yes. Um, and there's a lot of things that have changed in the last couple of years because of the pandemic. Now, I want to talk about a little of that, and I want to talk also a little bit about what, what happens when all that money dries up mm. that the federal government has been putting into propping us up to, to try to make us whole as much as they possibly could. Um, it, it's kind of hard to see, you know, to pick where to start on this because there's so many issues. Now, so you mentioned energy, okay? So I guess that's where we could start, okay? Uh, and the way I see it, okay, as, as, as just an individual that sort of watches things, uh, <clears throat> that we have a real major energy crisis in the world, not just here in the United States, uh, because of the reluctance of people wanting to stay with fossil fuels and want to go to clean energy, which I have no problem with. I think it's a, it's, it's a great idea, and I believe in, in that, so what we should do. However, I think, uh, personally, I think we're, we're sort of, you know, tried to push that a little bit too far too fast. I think we should continue to go for clean energy. And so what's your thoughts on the energy crisis of the world? And, and you know, where we were over $5 a gallon for regular gasoline, now we're down to like, you know, 465 but still way too much. And just one thing I just want to throw out is that I have found people have been worried, but now they're scared. It's a whole bit different ball game here. So I think whoever we put in to represent Vermont has to understand that the people are scared. Mm. And, and, and you have to understand that, or whoever, whoever gets in has to understand that, and have maybe some ideas of remedy of bringing down that scared part. Mm. So one fact that needs to be known and part of the conversation that isn't is that economic activity is 100% tied to energy. You look at any country in the world, the amount of their GDP, their, their economy is correlated to how much energy they use. You look at the, the graph of oil use per country and the size of the economy, it's a straight line. It's 100% tethered. That's not a new fact, everyone knows that. But what's not really acknowledged is that if we're to grow our economy at 3% a year, which is the standard thing economics, economics professors, economists, or politicians agree is, is kind of the, the normal thing you shoot for. You shoot for 3% economic growth per year. Well, that would mean that we would have used the same amount of energy in the next three decades as we have in the last 10,000 years. And that's impossible. And it's possible for a couple reasons. One, we only have 40 years of oil and gas left at existing rates of use. Um, and that's something that the pe people on the Republican side of the fence are a little bit scared to acknowledge because it means that there needs to be a lot of change and um, the, our traditional energy sources aren't going to last forever. Um, and then on the Democratic side, they're, they're pretty reluctant to acknowledge that we don't really have enough land to make renewables the replacement to fossil fuels because mm -hmm. Harvard professor David Keith has calculated that it would take up to 72% of our land to power the existing economy with, with uh, renewable energy, with yeah. wind, wind, wind yeah. or solar. Mm. So um, that implies a scale of change to how we operate as a civilization and how we think about an economy. Is it something that needs to grow forever? 
um, most things that are sustainable don't grow forever. That's actually a complete contradiction. So we should be a little bit scared because the kinds of problems we're dealing with are enormous and have enormous um, implications about how we need to change as a society. We need to probably be unrecognizable in a lot of ways. And the only way we can navigate that kind of change without scaring everybody, without collapsing into some sort of mess right. is with a system of government that is able to build broad-based support and trust among the people. And we do not have that right now. Mm -hmm. Thomas Jefferson said, the only safe depository for the ultimate power of society is the people themselves. And if we deem them not enlightened enough to wield that power wisely, then the remedy is not to just take their power from them. The remedy is to educate them and make them wise. So if you're scared about not having a, a government that's actually able to do these things and it requires a, a shift in how our government works, and you think the people are not really capable of, of navigating this type of enormous, complex, scary problem well, then we should probably be thinking about how we need to invest in educating people to be able to solve these kinds of problems. So, Liam, you're touching on that bit. Uh, the, the government, uh, I think, at least the, what, you know, in the time that I've been really paying attention, which has been you know, a few decades, um, seems to be taking more control of our lives. Uh, especially economically, uh, in, in, the, in the sense of uh, housing and, and food and, and, and everything. I mean, they're, they're, there's a great deal of people that are dependent on government for survival. Um, and I think that is something that we need to talk about. We need to adjust uh, to get people back uh, being Americans, wanting to work, wanting to get, go up in the world, uh, have more money, have a nicer house, so forth and so on. And that's be almost becoming out of reach for a whole lot of folks. So these are things that need to be talked about, but I don't see talked about very much. And I'm, you know, I'm an avid reader. I'm an avid you know, news watcher, and, and and none of the, sh you know, uh, shows really talk too much about this. And I think people want us to start talking about it. Not not just government people, but people in general. Almost like what they have as think tanks, you know, in all these universities. Uh, maybe they're doing it, but I don't hear about it. So I'll, I just want to tell you one little story that I had mm -hmm. uh, yesterday. In fact, I was at Shaw's grocery store. Okay. And I was uh, walking down the aisle, and I was looking at the prices like peanut butter. You know, peanut butter that was you know three ninety nine is six ninety nine now, right? I like the skippy peanut butter. And uh, and I'm walking down, and I, I you know I said oh, I'm not going to buy that. I'm going to wait until it goes on sale. So there's another lady doing the same thing. You know, young woman with a with a with a child. And I says, look at these prices. Don't you just want to scream? And she says, well, when I get to the register. I want to cry, <laughs> and and this is what's happening. So and and this is and we need to do something about it. I'm not just saying the government needs to do something about it because I'm tired of government just talking about it and really sometimes making it worse. I think it, we as citizens, uh, I, I'm just talking about my little community, my little fishbowl, the Greater Falls area, but the whole state of Vermont, okay, has to start looking at it as a, this this is our problem too. We can't expect the government, because that money's going to run out, we can't expect the government to be able to take care of us. We need to find ways of bringing us back together, putting people to work, whether or not it's entre entrepreneurs, so forth and so on, which Vermont is known for. So what's your thoughts on that? Well, inflation is deeply related to energy resources becoming more scarce. And if you look at just the situation in the Ukraine and how that affected our current uh, inflationary environment, there's there's no denying that as energy gets more expensive, it makes everything more expensive. That's correct. And so the logical thing would be, well, we need to, yes, have more energy independence, but also use our energy resources wisely. Right now, the price of energy, so there's there's a deep confusion that we use these terms interchangeably. The price of something, the cost of something, and the value of something. The value of fossil fuels, one barrel can do 500,000 hours of human labor. And we value that at like $60 to $100 a barrel. 
it, that, that's, the, that's the cost. But that, is that the value? So if we continue to expend our energy resources on like frivolous things like, you know, little plastic gadgets or, you know, that is a misallocation of a very precious resource that we're only valuing at the cost it takes us. So the solution to inflation is can we create more of it, right, so that there's less pressure to make the cost go up if there's more supply of it. But if there's really a, a hard limit on how much we can create in a given time, which those facts I said about finite resources of fossil fuel and not enough land for renewables, then we need to just have a more conscious allocation of this precious resource towards what is actually the most important stuff in society. And I would say a local, resilient, self-sustainable food system has to be number one. Right now, we use, according to the University of Michigan, 14 calories of fossil fuel energy to get one calorie of food. That is insane. It is, it is a drain on our um, most important resources to, to create food. It used to be in the 1800s, food was a surplus of energy. You know, we would put in some human labor and we'd get crops out and that was right. more caloric right. a, a surplus. It was a gain. So if we're not changing that dynamic where we're just wasting energy on things that produce some short-term profit for something that is actually useless or actually of, of incredibly frivolous, trivial value and not prioritizing putting our precious, precious finite energy resources towards building sustainable local supply chains of what actually matters, then we are fools. We're gonna wake up in 40 years and say, oh wow, we have this oceans of plastic garbage no one cares about, but we don't have uh, an ability to create food in our local communities. Um, like we need to invest these precious resources now consciously, yeah. wisely with local control. And, and I get what you're saying. And, and uh, a lot of people say, well, that's pie in the sky, Liam. You know, how are you going to be able to do that, right? I mean, you're so dependent on government now. So, you know, this, this, this is going to have to, the people are going to have to get behind this. So right. the, the goal is, is to get the people, to educate the people, whether or not they're, they're, they're low income, middle income, and, and, and the wealthy. We've got to get them all on the same page saying what you just said, uh, however, that that's going to be very difficult because you look at sure. <laughs> you look at Vermont and recycling. Oh yeah, let's recycle, let's recycle. Well, I know that most Vermonters don't recycle. So uh, because I've been a landlord, okay, and mm -hmm. I, I live in my little fishbowl, right, and I've tried to get them to recycle. You know, oh yeah, sure, Charlie. Well, you know, we'll recycle. And, you know, one of the problems is is that we say it and so forth. And we have recycling centers in most communities, so forth and so on. They're not open enough. You know, that makes it too difficult. Uh, the Coca-Cola bottles you get five cents for, so forth and so on. They still throw those away because you could go all the way to Springfield, to, yeah. and they don't have cars. So, you know, we come up with all these great ideas, but we don't come up with any solutions on how to make it very easy for these people to do it. These are the conversations that need to go uh, on, and they're not going on. So, okay, so let, let's go on to just another subject, okay? Because sure. we could talk about this probably for the full yeah, 15 minutes. Yeah, we could minutes. take any, any little thread right. and go for So it. let's go to housing, okay? Now, I've been a landlord in, in, uh, in Bellows Falls for over 30 years, and, and I came from Worcester, Massachusetts, by the way, uh, and I was a landlord there also. And um, Bellows Falls, our little community of Bellows Falls in the town of Rockingham, Greater Falls area, um, it was pretty sad. Uh, so you could buy, you know, a three-family for like $25,000, and they were rough. Yeah. You know, so, but the point is, there was a lot of potential if somebody really wanted to work hard. I wanted to really work hard because I wanted to make a life for myself, and I, and I love being on the Connecticut River. It's a wonderful community to live in, as you said. Yeah. And so uh, 30 years later, you know, I, I've... I've still got many of them. I have sold some of them, so forth and so on. Well, that same house that I had bought for $25,000, okay, is worth $200,000 now. So, you know, and that's only a 30-year period. I mean, inflation is one thing, but that's crazy, right? So, so many people are out of the ball game now because things have gone up so much. Yeah. Now, I, I want, I mean, I just want to tell you a, a little about my history, and, that, and I, that's enough. But what's happening now, okay, is that people want to come to Vermont from all over the United States, from all over the world probably, I don't know, especially places like Woodstock that, you know, the wealthy could go to it and buy a house for 
$5 million, you know, that type of thing, because they have the do dollars. But so many people being left behind because of this pandemic, especially, and because of costs going up on everything, not just food and gasoline, but housing especially. Now, this pandemic is, you know, they say it's pretty much over. I know, so we got our problems. We're still going to have vaccines, so forth and so on. But we're, we're hopefully at the end of this. So a lot of these programs that are in place now for housing people in the state of Vermont are going to stop yeah. in 2023. So you're going to have over minimum of over 2,000 people that have no home. All of a sudden, they're, they're living in you know apartments uh, that are being paid by the government. They're living in motel rooms. In fact, our little motel roadway in 100% of the, the, these people, 100 percent. Quality in uh, in Brattleboro, and, and every town ha has has people housed. And all of a sudden, they're not going to have this housing anymore. So you, if you do get in, OK, as U.S. representative uh, for the state of Vermont, how do, how, do, how, how do you think we should stop right now, OK? Because we still maybe have, you know, maybe a year at the most, the very most to be able to house these people. What do we do to prepare? Well, I think left or right, everyone agrees that you need more housing, right? Like why are costs up? Because there's more demand than there is supply. It's economics 101, right? So you, we need more housing, period. So that's, you, I would call that the midterm solution. It's, maybe it's even the long-term solution, depending on how quickly we mobilize. It really should be the midterm solution. The short-term solution, I think, the thing that gets you the quickest results, because it takes a while to mobilize a workforce and actually build houses, um, is, and that's a whole other issue that's deeply related to this, which is yeah. workforce, right? Because th those two, you know, you can't have a workforce unless you have housing for the workforce. And Correct. So it, they're, it's, it's a big issue. It's a big issue that connects everything. Um, but one thing that's happening more nationwide than here in Vermont is that huge pi private equity firms like BlackRock, one of the biggest investment funds in the world, are buying up mid to low income housing and renting it back to people. And so that's affecting this issue that we should probably regulate. We should probably uh, try and keep more housing available for low income people and either tax or somehow disincentivize these enormous, you know, wealthiest investment funds in the world from buying up housing stock and renting it back to people. Another issue that is more affected uh, by in Vermont is we have people who own several properties and Airbnb, most of them, because it's way more lucrative. The market will reward an Airbnb way more than it would a long-term housing situation, especially for a low-income person. So. That in the short term would probably be the fastest way to regulate this, to put some sort of limit on the amount of Airbnb that can happen in a community. If there's a, a deep workforce need in that community, we should probably prioritize that workforce getting there to be able to set up building more housing. It's an interesting idea. Yeah, yeah, because a lot of people are, especially, you know, what's coming down the road, especially elderly that live in these big houses, uh, especially like in, in a community like Bellows Falls that, you know, have uh, five bedrooms, six bedrooms, and they're living there by themselves uh, to to start talking about that issue. Another thing that should be being talked about, you know, in our community so, or any community. So I, th I think I just want to wrap this up because I talked about the short term, which is, you know, it's it's not the best solution, but, you know, regulating something just to help the market have some more space. Um, two would be, you know, just build more housing. But three, the long term thing for me is can People in the in certain industries, people who are part of the workforce we need in the building trades and the um, healthcare trades and in agriculture, is a big part of the state. Can we subsidize their um, home loans so that people in those those industries have zero percent home loans, as long as they're qualified in in some important ways that they're going to pay those loan backs? Um, that that would be one long term solution to this. Uh, another thing could be. You know, I got my education largely thanks to the GI Bill. And I don't think you should have to join the military as the only form of service that gets you these kind of benefits. So what if we reduced the military budget, still kept the best military in the world, mind you, because we spend more than almost every country in the world combined. So we have a lot of buffer to still have the best military in the world and spend less on it. Um, 
and had instead a building corps or an agriculture corps or you know some civilian service corps that like could, the Peace Corps and Vista. Right. That could help build this, this infrastructure country. that mm -hmm. we need. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, that's my long term vision is that it gives people not only meaningful work that contributes to the betterment of, of our communities in this country as a whole, but it also gives people meaningful skills that even if they only learned it for four years and then like I did in the military, went on and did something else, exactly. it gives them a background to, to build off and of. Good work ethic. Right, yes, and, yeah. and um, actually now, hard skills. Too. A little of that's going on right now, okay, but so minute amount, okay, and you see these, these shows that these kids are, you know, going to help, you know, build ho homes for the less fortunate, so forth and so on, but it's just such a small thing. So you're talking about on a larger scale, to, to really get maybe a, a, a department for this purpose. Yes. So this is what I want to hear for our, from personally from my U.S. representative to go to Washington. These are the things that I want them to, to, to bring forward to be able to do. And I don't hear too much about this from the other candidates. I mean, I've been sort of watching so forth and so on. Uh, so I, this is good. That, that, that's great. So l let's go on to another subject that's great. Uh, uh, we've talked about housing enough, but it's going to be a real problem in, in the near future, within the next year. So we really need to, you know, do some thinking about this. And in the ahead, state, of, ahead of the game. In the state of Vermont, okay? Yeah. I'm just talking about the state of Vermont and in the town of Rockingham and in the Greater Falls area because it's going to be traumatic here also. Everywhere in America is going to be traumatic, even New York City. Um, so let, let's go on to uh, drugs. Uh, it's it's a uh, subject that, obviously, being a landlord, I've had a lot of experience with, and I know in your own life you've had experiences with it also. Not that you know you were an addict. I don't want to you know say that, but I'm just saying that every every, every family has had someone who's been touched by the addiction crisis. Exactly. Sure. Yes. And and right now, because of all what's going on in the country, where police are very hesitant about doing anything about you know drugs and and you know there's there's still felony to have any any amount of heroin so forth and so on. Thirty days in jail, obviously, they're not doing that. That's not happening. So th there's a lot to be talked about where this drug issue is concerned. I was just telling Liam about uh, uh, an article I just read about uh, Ludlow that uh, the guy from Fish. One of the band members is, uh, I guess, got the permits in Ludlow to open up a 40-bed re rehab center with with a number with a, a nonprofit organization. But he's the one that spearheaded this because he had a drug problem 15 years ago and fought it and got rid of it. And and these are the little things that have to start happening and being talked about. I mean, let's talk about these things. So, you, so what what's your thoughts on on the drug issue? In, in Vermont. Well, uh, Charlie, I'm going to pander to you here because you, we've talked about this a lot, and I think you have a really good idea about it, but there needs to be uh, county-level long-term rehab. Um, there needs to be more rehabs. They need to be more long-term, and they need to be uh, better funded. So that's just kind of an obvious thing, but I still think that even that is still chasing the symptom instead of looking at the root cause. And the root cause is like, it needs to start with the question of why are there, why is there so much more addiction in our society? Or it, is there, or is it just, we're seeing it more? And I think everyone would say there's more. Every family has been affected. That's by correct. So um, to me, it's, it's another big complex problem that we can only talk about the surface of, but addiction to me is a response to a lack of meaning in life. And a lack of meaning in life is caused by a, a society that the forms of giving people meaningful contribution to society are becoming harder for people to access. One, because of um, like mainstream religions used to be the form people connected to their communities with and Correct. connected to some, some bigger story. And then it became more patriotism and then it became just work. And all of these things are being degraded by lots of big historical forces, just like automation making meaningful work harder to be in local communities, right? It's, it's being globalized, being outsourced. Um, so I think the solution to less meaningful stories for us 
to engage with is to have more local communities be, and we need to invest in the infrastructure that makes local community thriving. Because when you have meaningful relationships, have you ever heard of that, that study they did where the rats were given access to cocaine and they just kept pressing the lever until they basically starved to death or had heart attacks because they couldn't stop just getting their fix. Mm -hmm. But there was actually a control group of rats that had other rats, they had little pl places to play in, they had an environment that was good for healthy rats. And those rats didn't get addicted to cocaine because the environment of having strong relationships with other creatures was the, the preventative measure against addiction. So we need the infrastructure that creates those kinds of environments where local community is again the centerpiece of our lives. That's the big root cause level way of thinking about addiction, right? So we do need to address the symptoms because the symptoms can kill you if you don't address the symptoms. We need to get people better with those long-term rehab facilities. But if we don't invest in local community being again the center of people's lives, um, I think we can chase the symptoms all we want. We never really get that much ground. That, that, that statement is a hallelujah. That's a hallelujah statement for me, okay? I get it, okay? Community is so important, and we have lost a lot of that. I mean, you, you talk with the older folks, remember when we used to do this together as a mm. community and used to do this, so forth and so on. So the elderly, the older folks, and, and you know, n know it, and they have no answers to but this is why we have government. This is why we put, hopefully, somebody like yourself to be able to talk and, and get your point across. And you're going to always have pushback, um, no, no matter what the issue yeah. is, why it's not going to work, so forth and so on. But I don't think anybody can argue, argue with community. Community is number one, and that's what we have lost in America, and probably throughout the world, especially uh, in America. I mean, I can see it in our little fishbowl, how we've lost that. How, you know, you know I, I look around now and who's involved and who isn't. Trying to get volunteers, you know, to do things, it's like pulling teeth, you know, oh, I'm too busy, so forth and so on. And, and the thing is, we, we're not going out, I think, in a way that we can sort of get these folks that say, no, we don't have the time. No, no, we don't need a whole lot of your time. We want you to do something that you're interested in. And this is how we bring our communities back together because they get involved, like they have a purpose. You have to have a purpose in life, otherwise you feel hopeless and we go, we go into lot, lot, go into drugs. Yeah. You know, they say, oh, I, I need, I need to feel that high. And today's drugs are not like you know, even the cocaine and the other stuff. Today's drugs are, the, are killing people. Over a hundred thousand people were died last year in America, under the age of forty. That's more people than died in the twelve years of the Vietnam War. Yeah, because only fifty-five thousand died in yeah. Vietnam, right? So these are the issues that need to be talked about. Um, I don't know how much time we have left. Can can I can, can I get a timing on this? Or somebody listening to me here. What time? How much time we got left? Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Wow. Okay, we got ten minutes left. So I, I'm going to give you a final statement on, on everything. But I just want to go into the, the, the one other thing that seems to be, you know, big issue obviously in Vermont is the environment. Okay, um, I think you know it. Uh, we in Vermont, no matter how, you know, whether or not we have uh, Republicans, independents, or Democrats, we're doing a damn good job where the environment is concerned. And that's why a lot of people want to come here yeah. and are coming here because of our environment, our clean air, the green mountains, the so forth and so on. But how can we even improve upon that in Vermont? I mean, yeah, I agree with you. Vermont, Vermont is doing a, a pretty good job keeping rivers clean, keeping air clean, giving us uh, a lot of natural beauty. Um, my main concern about the environment is that we use resources sustainably and that we don't have our pollution choke out the natural world. So you look at um, fishing, it said that over 90% of the big fish in the ocean are gone, right? So if we don't view the keeping the natural world's ability to regenerate itself as a top priority, mm -hmm. um, then future generations are just going to be left, I think, bankrupt. And it bankrupt, maybe not financially, but bankrupt in the beauty of life. So 
I think Vermont's in a, in a lot of ways an example, and um, it's more the the wider world environment that I'm concerned about because we have a, a pretty much a continent of plastic floating in the oceans right now. Um, we are using fossil fuel resources in a way that will use them up within my lifetime, certainly my children's lifetime. Um, and, you know, that's to say nothing about climate change. Like, it's just, you can leave that issue aside and say, we're unsustainably using our natural resources in a way that it will, it will cause devastation and chaos to the basis of economy, of our economy if we don't treat these resources sustainably. And we need, in a, in a lot of aspects, international agreements and different international structures because no one owns the ocean, right? It's hard to have a police officer out there that says, you're fishing too much. Um, so we need to have frameworks of agreement that are actually effective because the UN clearly isn't, right? Like we're still using these resources in a way that is going to deplete them before my children's generation even has a chance to You know, them. we I see a lot of programs on the environment, you know, and so forth and so on. But you got to get more people on board because, you know, the, 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 most people on, on their minds right now is, you know, to feed my children, you know, how, much, you know, how to get to work because I only have X amount of money for gas and so forth and so on. So we've got to get, you know, we're going to take care of these problems first before we can get peop more people on board to, to say, yeah, okay, you know, Thank you. We, we've gotten back to normalcy in the sense that a dollar is worth a lot more, you know, than it, than it was two years ago. So, and, and and my goal, okay, my personal goal is to get my little fishbowl more involved in our community, uh, in in picking people like yourself and others that like something and say, hey, yeah, you can get involved this way. And uh, um, we 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 as a, a society have sort of lost that, you know, saying. You know, because a lot of people, oh, I don't have the time. But th th they do have the time, okay? They can take out, an hour isn't much a month, or a couple of hours isn't much a month. Plus, it'll make you feel good, especially mm -hmm. to the ones that sort of go through life and not really feel good about themselves. All of a sudden, they're doing something for their community, and that makes you feel good, doesn't it? That's the, the number one like way to have meaning in your life is to serve other people, right? <laughs> All right, Liam, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm so happy that uh, we're able to get together and do this show. We're going to send this uh, around to the other access shows um, in, in the state of Vermont, all 14 counties. So hopefully they will air, and I think they will because they need programming. <laughs> and I thought that would be a great idea to get your thoughts out without, a, without other candidates uh, coming into it. And really sort of you're not real, you didn't have to prepare because you have, I mean, I ask you random questions, so you sort of have this in your mind. Either people say, yeah, that, hey, Liam's, you know, talking straight, and I, I like what he's saying. Or they're going to say, well, no, no, he's, he's just pie-in-the-sky stuff. But personally, why I'm doing this is because <clears throat> I think you are a listener, and that is so important. You know, so many people say they're listeners, you know, but they're really not. They're just, you know, they're, they're, their agenda is their agenda. Um, but if I have a, a different uh, opinion, um, y you seem to listen, and I hope that's the case. Is that the case? Well, that means a lot to me that you say that. But it's funny that you, that listening is the, uh, the 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 primary value because if I had one mission, it's to make a pol a political office holder irrelevant to have your voice heard, right? So I I don't want it to be. Liam is good at listening and because I only have so much bandwidth. How many people could I ever possibly listen to? But if we have a way where in, in many states, over half the states, you can put a law, you can propose a law and see if other people want to vote for it. And if you get enough community around that, it doesn't matter if your elected official agrees with you or not or gives you that time of day. Like That's what we need. There's no way I could ever be good enough at listening to people, honestly. You know, it, it, I could... I could just BS people and say, oh, I'm just going to listen to everybody. It's like, that's not real, right? What we need is a system for you to be able to have a voice, even if I disagree with you. That's my main mission. I, that's, that's the missing piece. That's why I gave you that whole Thomas Jefferson quote earlier. If we don't have the people have actual power, then they can never take real responsibility. And so that's what, if I did one thing as a congressional representative, is to make it so that 
people can bypass politicians who don't listen to them and make whether or not I agree with you in a relevant matter. Because if you can put a good idea out there and build community around it, then it shouldn't matter if someone won an elected office. Hallelujah. So you got a one minute closing statement. Um, Hey everybody, my name is Liam Madden. I am running as an independent in the Republican primary, and you can vote. Uh, you can vote early if you vote early, but it's August 9th, Tuesday, August 9th. And um, I think you just heard my last closing statement. I, I'm I'm deeply committed to creating a government that works, and you can't create a government that works without people being involved. And in order to get people to be actually inspired to be involved, you need to give them more power, and that is exactly what I want to do. Thank you, Liam, for coming in. Uh, for future shows, as I say, uh, I'm going to uh, hopefully continue to do this maybe once a month, or maybe more. But I want it to become almost a, sort of a think tank. A lot of universities have think tanks. You know, people get together on a particular issue, whether or not it's drugs, housing, the environment, and they talk about it and, and, and get different ideas on how to get involved, so forth and so on. So if you have an idea, on a think tank idea, whether or not it's drugs, whether or not it, uh, whatever it may be, and whether or not it's some fish like Liam was talking about in the ocean. Um, send me an email. Uh, we'll be putting this up on the screen. Uh, my email is cjarras at yahoo.com, and it will be on the screen when this goes live, wherever it's going to be going. And uh, we'll, we'll be able to uh, maybe get you in and start talking about an issue that you're interested in and that you're passionate about. And that's what I want to do, be able to get people that are passionate about a particular issue and to sort of get their point across. And I think I do a relatively good job of, of getting people to talk like I did today. All right, well, thank you once again for watching Falls Area Community TV. I'm Charlie Jarris, and hopefully I'll see you on the next show.